Hey, welcome to the PC Perspective Mailbag. This is episode 21. I'm recording it on December 5th, 2017. And today you get me. Uh, Alan is away. Ryan's still away. And instead, you've got me answering your questions. I was a little disappointed. Some of the questions were a little tame, but what can you do? Armand LaRoche. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. He asked, do you think we will see consumer-grade voltage GPUs using PCIe 4.0 spec? My understanding is that GPUs can't even take full advantage of PCIe 3.0. So, would Volta be a big enough jump for the new spec to make a difference? Well, they might use on the consumer side uh, PCIe 4.0. I mean, we kind of saw that in the jump to PCIe 3.0. Uh, video cards seem to support that specification before we saw motherboards and chipsets handle that. So it's not beyond the realm of possibility. Uh, but as you mentioned, PCI 3.0 is not really uh, hampering current GPUs, even, even top-end stuff. I mean, uh, how long have we seen SLI and Crossfire uh, implementations on Intel's 2x8 uh, PCI 3.0 uh, implementations on the consumer desktop side. So uh, specs are still, I think they've yet to be ratified for PCI 4.0, but they have a working spec. People are developing products to work with that, but is NVIDIA going to do with Volta? I don't know. They might. It really depends on how complex PCI 4.0 is to actually implement. Uh, my guess would be the one after that because uh, we're still looking at like a late 2018 time frame before we see motherboards that support that. So it'll be interesting to see, and we'll certainly keep our eye on that one. DBS7 asks, were you surprised that Intel announced an APU with HPI before AMD? Yes. Uh, there has been talk from AMD about an APU utilizing HBM memory that they would use in high-performance computing solutions and so far we have not seen it. So it's interesting to see Intel having one of their Intel CPUs and AMD GPU and featuring an HBM connection. That's it's crazy talk. Who would have thought? But uh, yeah, I, I was, was quite surprised Intel was able to do that as quickly as they were and uh, we have yet to see how cost-effective that implementation is and it's going to be interesting to see how well it performs. So, uh, we shall see. The Sherman, what future CPU process technology are you most interested in? Uh, that's probably easy. It's going to be EUV. We've been waiting for that technology forever. Uh, we have some of the first 100 watt units uh, on the market, 100 watt lamps. And uh, they're, I think they're, they're pushing for 250. 50 watt for a lot of production type stuff. So we're getting closer to that. I think that'll again be a late 2018, 2019 when we finally start seeing products on that, but it's needed. I mean, we've got, uh, we've got, you know, the older lith uh, immersion lithography and to get to the feature size that they want, they have to do, uh, you know, double, triple, quad exposure and so, you know, they, they expose, etch, expose, etch, expose, etch, and it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of extra money to be able to do that and implement it effectively. And it's just a, a more complex procedure to have to do that because you've got to line everything back up and make sure everything is looking hunky-dory. And it's a pain. And EUV is going to take some of that complexity away, but probably exchange with a different kind of complexity. Obviously, it's taken us a long, long time to get to EUV lamps. And Confia. Lisa Sue recently went on CNBC and, and when asked about the impact of cryptocurrency mining on AMD sales, said that miners amount for only mid-single digits percentage of the company's total business. We know that AMD GPUs are flying off the shelves thanks to miners, so does this mean that discrete GPU sales are a far smaller piece of AMD's revenue than we have been led to believe? I, I don't think it is a larger piece, and I don't think that AMD has kind of been lying to us and, and doing that, because 
if you think of all of the chips that AMD is able to sell and GPUs, the real tail market <clears throat> is not its biggest customer. It's, it's certainly the one that you see the most, but it's not the biggest. So when they look at the overall um, amount of, of chips and graphics cards sold, it's, you know, it is a couple of percentage points that they think that miners are taking, but it has an inordinately large effect on the retail market because when have you ever seen a retail mobile GPU? Like, never. And so those are the products that AMD sells a lot of. They sell to the OEMs. Uh, they sold to the, the white, mark, white box market and uh, other OEMs. And so those are, you know, kind of the larger aspects of its business. And retail is, you know, it's still a significant um, amount of money. It's just not their most important. So that's what I kind of believe. Mike Fox asks, are there any new products being produced that are using really old process nodes? I'm, I'm not sure, but you know things like audio codecs, uh, networking chips, all of these things use older process nodes because there's no real reason to go to a, a, you know, a smaller geometries on these things, which, I mean, how big of a network chip do you really need? What kind of, of, of capabilities uh, do you require that needs to run on a, a smaller, a more efficient process? Um, you know, one of the big problems with uh, things like this, if you've got a pretty small chip, you've got a small amount of, of, of pads on the back that, you know, the substrate connects to, and then all the ball grid array uh, on that substrate then that goes to the product. So if you've got a really small chip and you've got room for like two pads, it's not going to work. So a lot of these, you know, other chips, uh, a lot of the I.O. stuff, uh, chipsets for like motherboards, uh, they're typically made a node or a node or two behind the CPU side. So there are plenty of uh, plenty of products that utilize older nodes. Uh, and I think that if we dug further, we'd be kind of shocked that, you know, hey, somebody's using that 250 nanometer, uh, you know, process node that's a couple of hundred bucks away for if even that, and they've got all these chips that we see everywhere, but we just don't realize that they're on that particular process node. Wazim Azar, is there any such thing as CPU redundancy? I know that two socket motherboards are common in the enterprise. Is it just that they're to leverage more compute and for better heat dissipation, or does it serve any other purpose beyond that? Well, it's kind of an interesting question. If you look at the big iron stuff, like uh, uh, you know AIX machines from IBM, you know the big mainframes, they've got redundant CPUs. So it's just not you know, hey, look at all these cores here; they're all in use. They've got a ton of redundancy in there, and that includes redundant CPUs, uh, like blade servers and whatnot. No, uh, you're not going to see really redundant. CPUs in that. I mean, if you've got a CPU that dies in a blade, it's just gonna it's gonna shut down. Um, they're gonna transfer the load somewhere else and you know replace that hardware. Uh, same thing with you know any kind of server, small business server. If the CPU dies, it's you typically something really bad has happened to the server in the first place, and you've got to take things down because you know the operating system, whether you're using you know Microsoft Windows, Linux, or ESXi. Um, if you lose a CPU, it's 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 going to be bad bad times. And so, uh, you know, if higher end stuff, you're going to see some migration. But you know, when in the big iron things, that's where that stuff just happens seamlessly. You lose a CPU, everything just keeps running. I mean, it's it's damn near bulletproof, and that's why they pay the big money that they do for those products. Uh, but in any kind of you know two socket motherboards, you're not going to see any kind of redundancy in terms of uh, uh, just, you know, quality, um, making sure stuff doesn't break. Uh, they're going to utilize as many cores as they can. And so if you don't need that many cores, you're going to have one socket product. And if the CPU dies, well, you're just SOL, and you've got to get things replaced, or you migrate that all to another machine 
and go from there. But uh, yeah, you won't see redundancy unless you get into the really heavy duty big iron stuff. Nick Kearney asks, in a racing sim using manual gears when downshifting under brakes, how do you best avoid revving the engine while not looking like a noob that do downshifts all at once? P.S. Any recommendations for a sub $200 wheel and pedal set with flappy paddle shifters that works with Xbox One, PS4, and PC? Okay, a couple of things. Uh, go on to YouTube and uh, watch a video of, like, you know, rally driver uh, foot action. And typically you'll then see a camera on the rally driver guy's feet and how they they do the clutch, brake, downshift, all of that. I mean, they, they do things like, you know, they, they do the, the side, uh, uh, they, they, they turn, you know, one foot this way so it grabs two pedals at the same time as they're kind of getting everything going. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite the ballet if you've ever watched a manual guy do that. Um, any recommendations for sub $200 wheel that works with Xbox One, PS4, and PC? You're not going to find one that supports all three things. You're going to have one that's either Xbox and PC or PS4 and PC. And that's because of licensing issues of uh, developing these products. So you're not going to see anything for the under $200 range. You're going to be looking at the Thrustmaster TMX or the uh, uh, Thrustmaster which one is it? T150. That's the PS4 version of PC. TMX is Xbox and uh, Xbox One and uh, PC. Uh, if you go a little higher, I think that Logitech is now, they've dropped their prices on their G29 and G920s. So you're getting, you know, a pretty good wheel for, uh, for around 230, 250 bucks, depending on the sales. So good luck in trying to find that and uh, good luck in not looking like a noob when downshifting and, and, and getting your rev so high. Alfredo Monclus, what do you think about direct drive wheels? Have you tried one? Uh, I have not tried one yet, but I would like to eventually. I know that uh, Fanatec, uh, Fanatic, is going to be releasing one here shortly, uh, within the next four months. Uh, direct drive wheels typically have a lot of power to them. Uh, they're very, very fast in uh, how they uh, react. Um, they're really, really, really nice, but they're expensive because you've got to have a pretty strong motor and you've got to have a really strong power supply to be able to handle that. So that's why you see these at a minimum of about 1800 bucks, 1500 to 1800 bucks, And that's a pretty good chunk of change. And that's just for the uh, uh, the base itself and the power supply for it. There's some do-it-yourself kits that are for a little bit less, but it's it's just uh, you know it's it's a lot of money, and uh, they really don't produce a whole lot of these just because how many people are willing to spend that kind of money on on a wheel when you get you know good 85 percent of of that experience for less than half the price. So we'll see. Rave OK. If Zen Plus is indeed manufactured on 12 nanometer LP process, what are the chances that Global Foundries can squeeze another 300 to 500 megahertz conservatively out of the chips? And what about IPC and memory compatibility improvements? Well, first of all, it's not going to be Zen Plus that they're looking at on 12 nanometer. I mean, they might, but I think that Zen Plus may be aimed towards 10 nanometer. Now, the refresh of Zen looks like it might be. 12 nanometer and that is you know it is a marginally mediumly improved 14 nanometer node from Global Foundries based on Samsung's 14 nanometer uh, I think 300 to 500 megahertz improvement is is certainly in the ballpark for these while retaining the same kind of power consumption maybe you know maybe 300 megahertz is, is probably what you're looking at rather than 500 but still, any kind of improvement in uh, in clock speed is going to help them out without uh, you know uh, blowing up that uh, thermal envelope. Uh, IPC improvements and memory compatibility, we might see some. I think we're going to see you know a couple of percentage of IPC improvement, and uh, in terms of memory compatibility, yeah, they'll, they'll probably tweak the the memory uh, um, controller a little bit. 
but don't expect any kind of massive improvements. Don't think that uh, you know you'll you'll trade in chips and at the same clock speed get a 10% IPC performance. It's it's not going to happen. I think it's going to be a lot more like uh, bulldozer to pile driver, and if those two products were a year apart, and the improvements in overall power and just kind of uh, you know overall performance and, and corner cases, pile driver was was a significant improvement uh, for AMD. Bulldozer was just not that fantastic, um, as we as we well know, and it certainly didn't last very long on the market. I mean, less than a year before pile driver got pushed out. So you know, I think that we're going to see in this next six months, you know, a new Zen based on probably this new 12 nanometer process technology. And uh, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a nice little refresh, kind of like, you know, in the years past when we saw the Phenom 2 go from like the, uh, what, 920 to 930 to 940. And, you know, just significant little uh, performance increases here and there. Mikey Chowster, he is asking Josh, if you took over PC Per, what immediately changes would you make? Well, first of all, I'd probably hire Ryan back to be the business manager because I tried running a website 10 years ago and I was making 1300 a month at max. And uh, yeah, I just didn't have the business acumen to keep that going as well as what uh, Ryan is is able to do. Uh, if I also took over, I would I'd probably do a lot more t-shirts, smart ass t-shirts. Get those out to you guys as uh, soon as you possibly can. Uh, I'd probably plaster my face on videos a whole lot more. <laughs> and then I'd have everybody send me the CPUs and video cards and motherboards and I will sit on them on a throne and uh, taunt them with my material wealth. Uh, until, of course, the business goes under because not even Brian can keep something afloat when there are no really good reviews coming out. So anyway, that is the PC Perspective Mailbag 21. I'm Josh Walrath, and thanks for hanging out with me. It's raining bad.